Hey, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Late Night Happy Hour. Brian Kamenetsky and Andy Kamenetsky. Uh, busy, busy, busy night in the NBA. Uh, busy day around the league. And uh, we had a great guest today to talk about stuff. Andy, I think uh, our, the Laker fans in our, in our audience, and there are a few, are going to enjoy the conversation that we had with the New York Times uh, NBA writer, Sopan Deb, uh, also an author, of course, because we spent the first, I don't know, 10, 15 minutes, however what much it was, talking about how disappointing the Celtics are. Yeah, and, and you could you can see, you will see Sopan trying to put out a, you know, it's it's not that bad. You know, it's it, things aren't going well, but let's all maintain perspective. I think knowing deep down that it really isn't that fine. The perspective is not quite sure how it's going to get fine. And either way, everybody watching this thing, they're going to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, so uh, we covered a ton of stuff with Sopan. Uh, good stuff also including newly minted all-star Julius Randle, who's somebody that Andy and I have been uh, following and supporting even after he left L.A. Uh, and, of course, uh, Dave Matthews Band Talk because it's Sopan. Um, so <laughs> let's uh, let's get into that now. Our interview with uh, Sopan Deb of the New York Times. And uh, thanks for coming back on. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. I'm really excited. I love doing this show. Well, um, not enough to do it live, like the oh, first time, beginning listen, at one a.m. Listen, listen, man. It's it's not listen. It's not my fault. You guys go on so late. You guys should be more considerate and go on earlier for East Coast fans. Look, man. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, West egg. Coast, best coast, baby. <laughs> Yeah, actually, you're not wrong. It's it's like 25 degrees here. It's been like this for like a month here. It's the difference between uh, a guy with a book that he's promoting and just a guy. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, because the last time we had soap on, on, he was promoting his book, which is outstanding. Um, uh, and uh, you know, it, people should people should go pick it up. Uh, mistranslations. Next, meeting. next book. Next what? book. Yeah. Online. Right. It, it tell nice. us that you're writing a novel. Yeah. This isn't even just like a, a book about yourself. It's an actual novel. It's very yeah. impressive. Uh, the book actually is written. Actually, so the thing about fiction is that you have to write the whole thing first before selling it, whereas nonfiction, so memoirs, and you could actually just do that off a of proposal. So uh, over the summer, I, it took me about six months. I wrote a novel um, you know, based on the community I grew up in and um, – very fortunate. You know, it's interesting, you know, when I finished writing it, it was, you know, I was like, oh, this is a fun exercise to try. It was cool to do it. I mean, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then you're like, oh, I don't really care if it sells because, you know, you just did it for fun. It's for yourself. And then like, then you really want it to sell. But, <laughs> like, then, and then, and then, you know, your first couple of weeks, you're like, okay, why, why aren't publishers like breaking down my door to buy this? And then, and then it turns into what if it doesn't sell at all? You know? <laughs> um, but thank, thankfully, you know, we had interest and, and um, Simon and Schuster brought it. And bought Th that's it. where you go full circle. You go back to, well, I don't care if it sells. I don't care. <laughs> yeah. so it's really, it's, it's about yeah. the art. I, I will tell you that ne that that full circle never happens. Once it's out there, <laughs> it, there's no, it's just crushing disappointment. But um, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised you even started with, I don't mind if this doesn't sell. I just, it was a good exercise. It was for me. It was personal. I would have, I, the idea of even starting to sit down and write anything before I knew I could make any money off of it now at this point seems so bizarre. I, I respect that you did I mean, it. it. It is bizarre. Um, but, um, but I get it, pissed it, off if any email I write doesn't end up a bestseller. <laughs> like, I mean, but, the hell was that effort about? I think I think otherwise you're just not going to want to write the whole thing. But that's right. the reality of it is that that's how that's how novels get sold. Like the reality of it is that unless you write the whole thing, you are not going to sell it. That's like that's just how it works. So you know that when you're writing it. So just like you can't even think of like, well, what if it doesn't sell? Well, it doesn't matter because it, it really won't sell unless you write it. You know. <laughs> so that explains why I've never sold a novel. By the not way. with that attitude, my friend. Yep. No, that I'm also not sure. I'm, I'm, I know what to write about or if I'm good at it. But um, th that that is one of many reasons that Sopan is uh, appearing with us uh, earlier in the day today. Uh, but this is th we are at an interesting time. Uh, the Knicks are near 500. And so are the Celtics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I will say that I have in a given, let's say I have 10 basketball takes in a given, you know, whatever. Nine of them will be horribly wrong, mm -hmm. but one is totally right. 
<laughs> and the one that I had right before the season started that I thought there was a chance the Celtics, Celtics wouldn't make the playoffs. And I'm on the record because I was on uh, Yarn Weitzman's podcast. And I said, my hot take here is that I think the Celtics might not make the playoffs. And, and, and really, with the Celtics' struggles, it really comes down to, look, they lost, they lost Gordon Hayward, an all-star caliber player, and they didn't replace him. Mm-hmm. And and you you there you could make an argument that Danny Ainge should have done more blah, blah blah you know whatever but the reality is they did not replace him and when you lose an all star caliber player a starter you're gonna lose a lot of wins you know and so that's what happened has happened with the Boston Celtics this year um, and you know so no I don't think it's that surprising that they're I think sixteen and fifteen or whatever the whatever their win loss record is like this is. Yeah. You know, they don't have a lot of. You know, when you you get when you lose all stars, you either got to replace them or take a step back and win. That's how it is. And then you know the injuries. Kemba's not Kemba, and, yeah. and Marcus Smart being out hurts. And and you compound all that. So it is funny though. Like the Hayward thing doesn't get talked about very much. Like I, I think because Charlotte is seen to have overpaid for him. Um, at least. Well, like- and- and and frankly, I mean, so far Charlotte is getting their money's worth. He's playing really well. He's playing really well. But the <laughs> but the idea of just paying Hayward what they paid him, the 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 storyline became they overpaid for a player who's not quite that good, and not huh. I wonder if the Celtics like the Celtics shouldn't have paid him that much. But I wonder if they're gonna. We skipped over the part of whether or not Boston was actually well, going to miss him. And if you're right, the Charlotte, the same exact conversation happened last year with Terry Rozier, and Terry Rozier who was bad for the Celtics in that last year. That And then he gets, I think, like 17, 18 per year from Charlotte. No, maybe more. I don't, I don't remember. That. But a number that was eye-popping. And then in these first two years, Terry Rozier has just killed it in Charlotte. Killed it. Um, look, the thing about Gordon Hayward is that he was great last year for the Celtics. But he didn't get talked about as much because – he was like the fourth option behind Tatum Brown and Kemba Walker. But he averaged something like 17, 6, and 5 or something on 50% shooting. He was very, very good. He just didn't get the shine because he was the fourth option. But you still got to replace him. And unfortunately, with the timing, because they gave Hayward that extra time to work out a sign and trade or they come to his decision, you know, a lot of the good free agents came off the market. You know, the guys they might have signed, like Christian Wood or someone like that. And it just so – you know, it just they just didn't come together. And, and I'll, I'll be honest, I was surprised then, still surprised now, that by all reports, they had the ability to do a sign and trade and bring in Miles Turner and that they yeah. didn't opt to do that. That I found that shocking. Like the yes, idea of although I will push back on that only that only to say that uh, I I don't remember the exact dollar amount that Charlotte ended up giving Gordon Hayward. I think it's like what 30 30. I'll look I'll look it up. Yeah, something in the thirty something million. It's yeah, a per year, it was more than I believe Indiana was offering. So it's not clear that Indiana was one hundred percent. That may, that may be, but yeah. apparently though, Boston really but, just was not interested in Miles Turner, which I just find strange. The idea that you'd rather let somebody that's been when healthy that important to your team walk, yeah. as opposed to replacing him. We, you know, I mean could say with anybody but in the case of miles turner miles turner is a good player yeah like, he's, a, that, he's a he's a defensive player of the year candidate yes right? yeah i mean he's, he, he's, a, he's a really four good years player. four years 120 million right is so the, is the number four four for I 120 think that number that fourth year plus the per year number was it, it was unclear whether indiana was ever going to get there and so we don't so we don't know sure. actually whether that miles turner deal if that was actually what was going to be the final thing that was on the table because you know it's also possible that when gordon hayward was like you know what thanks charlotte i'm going to go with indiana that at that point once the celtics knew that he was definitely going to indiana that they might have taken that deal but it, it didn't it didn't end up mattering because he spurned indiana anyway so he ended up charlotte for more money and more years so you know but to your point yeah i mean danny hange has a history of making a lot of trades 
and at the same time not trading for stars because he wants to hold on to his 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 uh draft picks and younger players and etc and so there is there is a running theme of that and i i, I think it's perfectly fair to wonder if miles turner was one of those players that got away well, okay now if, so you know and, and for people who are unaware uh sopan is a big celtics fan in real life I, I'm, I'm gonna ask a question that could lead to either some frustration or venting and i just want you to know with with this audience that is Los Angeles based, uh, probably 97% Lakers fans. This is a safe space for you, my friend. <laughs> okay. For you, for you, feel free to be yourself. Feel free to let your emotions out. What's the fan base feeling right now with both Danny Ainge and Brad Stevens? Because I get a sense the last couple of years, the natives have been getting restless and dissatisfied. I, I mean, it's Boston. I mean, they're they could win a chance. I remember, I remember when the Sox won the World Series. I mean, and there was a there was a call a caller called into WEI the next day to express his dissatisfaction. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean <laughs> it's, it's the Boston. I mean, fans are by nature irrational. You know, you know people. You know, this team just went to uh, the Eastern Conference Finals last year, and let me tell you, before last season, no one expected the Celtics to go to the Eastern Conference Finals last year. No one. Um, and so, ultimately, I don't know if fan reaction really matters much for this particular fan base, which is not known for being rational reasoned and right infant. um now with that being said this is a team that has won one championship in 30 plus years right so in that respect but but like okay yes this season is not going that well but jalen brown is how old jason tatum is how old you know that's and they're signed long term mm -hmm. like how much how much there are a lot of teams that would love to have two building blocks that are that young and that good and locked in long term. There are Celtics fans that are upset. You could be in a lot worse shape right now. Oh, there's no question. But like you know, look, you started this out, and, and a lot of our audience was like, "Go on, you know, yeah. with the you know the Celtics are missing the playoffs." This is oh. But there's no question this season is, is a disappointing one. But that's what so that's what I want to get at here because you know they, they are being held up by the Eastern Conference, which quite I mean, look the entire league. It's a bizarre year just because the entire league is sort of pulling towards that. There's an inertia towards 500 yeah. this year yeah. that's stronger than Boston, in most. Right? It's, yeah. it's Milwaukee, Milwaukee, it's, uh, yes, it's Toronto, it's Miami. That's four of the top teams in the East last year that are like way below their pace last year. And so, you know, it's not unique to Boston. There's clearly something weird about COVID and whatnot and, and the postponements and blah, 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 blah. Heck, even the Nets, who I know they've won five straight, but, you know, the Nets who have three top 10 players, you know, in their starting lineup, they haven't looked unbeatable until these last, this last week or so. Like, so everybody is going through their stuff right now. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, now, again, Ours, they're just like us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, again, the Celtics should be better than one game over 500. But by what? how much? You know, they, they, yeah. they lost a star and didn't replace him. Like, what were the realistic expectations for a team that just blatantly, even leaving it aside COVID related stuff, this team blatantly lost talent and didn't replace it? What was it? What was the realistic expectation to go farther than last season? What was, what was, I don't know what that was. So, you know? but where, where do you think it ends up though? Because, like, I, you know, I, I, Brooklyn is starting to look like at least we got a blueprint for what it looks like if they can get a stop somewhere in a game. You know, they, like, they come back on Phoenix because they put a couple stops together. They keep the Lakers from scoring, but right now everybody's doing that. That's not that hard. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're getting that. But the flip side is they keep doing it with one of their people out, whether it's Kyrie or Hart, or, you know, Durant or whatever. And I do think it matters what it looks like defensively when all three of those guys are playing. We haven't quite seen a lot of that yet. But, like, where do, where do you think this ends up with Boston? Because, you know, like the, just Tatum and Brown, you would think would be enough. And then you add in Kemba and you add in Smart when he like they should be good enough to be in the top four of the Eastern Conference, pretty decent record, you would think. 
So where in the end does this end up, assuming Kemba heals over the course of the season and Smart comes back? Yeah. Well, before the 5 of 5 for 21 that he shot against New Orleans, Kemba had a pretty good week. He was finally putting mm-hmm. it together. Smart comes back after the All-Star break. And in theory, the Celtics should start playing a little better at that point. In theory. You know, um, you have guys like Aaron Neesmith that are starting to play themselves into rotation players, you know. And the Celtics have this $30 million trade exception that that I assume they're going to have to use at some point by, by the trade deadline. Can he's you do that, though, with Ainge, though? Ainge is, you know, we always sit there and assume that Danny Ainge is going to use – he's going to use those picks. He's going to use that something. And they ne- he never does. But, they but never the use difference them. with the trade exception is that he has to use it. Otherwise, it goes away, right? Like, so, I mean, like, okay, it could go away. Right, it could. But counterpoint, but, he watched he, Gordon Hayward go away. Yeah, but Danny's. I mean, look, Ainge just publicly said that he absolutely intends on using it. Now, using it requires someone else to want to take it. You know, the 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 effect of half the league, more than half the league being near five hundred, is that there are a lot more buyers than there are sellers. Right. Mm-hmm. So, if it, to take on a trade exception, you're likely a seller. Right. And so if you're a seller, you think your team's not a contender, you think your team's rebuilding. But with the play in tournament and the fact that there's this inertia that we talked about before, there are gonna be a lot, there's a lot more teams that are trying to make the playoffs and don't feel the need to give away someone for a trade exception. All right, how about this? Trade exception plus a lamello, a, a lamello ball digital piece from top uh, top shot. Uh, Danny's not gonna. Uh, Dan, Danny, I don't know if he's given up his young assets for Top Shot. He might. I'm not sure if he's there yet. Okay. Well, we'll see know. because that's yeah, that's maybe, got some value. Maybe Romeo, maybe Romeo Langford for the Top Shot. And where yeah. where are you on that? Because, oh, sorry. Like, <laughs> sorry. Well, I, wait, I messed that up. So yeah, <laughs> Romeo Langford plus the trade exception for Top Shot, and I, I think that's it. That's all. You know, what's, you know what's funny is, I think the trade exception for the Celtics is like. 400 grand short of what it would take to absorb Andre Drummond because in yeah. theory like in theory like okay right. there's the right. obvious place you go you you know I you find right. you find some asset that you're willing to give up you know young prospect whatever your your Romeo Langfords of the world something someone yeah. like Peyton that maybe. Yeah. I don't know about him he's been I think been maybe too good for a rental but who knows but either way I think because I, I you can't make an exception bigger by clearing room. I don't believe so. No, I don't think you can either. Right. So like you're looking at that and it's like, I'm sure from Danny Ainge's perspective, there's like a, because that that would make incredible sense to do something like, I know you've got Tyson. I know you've got Tristan Thompson, but I mean, all, he's, all the Williams is his. Right. Yeah, but I, I, I still mean, think, I still think somebody well, like him listen, could make sense. Anyone that follows me on Twitter knows I'm a big Andre Drummond guy. I'm a big Andre Drummond guy. Um, I think I, you know, look, I think I, I think he'd be very good on the Celtics. Unfortunately, they they already have multiple Williams, a Tice, a Tristan Thompson. You know, I'm sure I'm missing somebody. You know, um, um, but you're right. Yeah, the trade exception. But those guys maybe could get. Those guys maybe could. You'd feel free to move somebody yeah, oh, here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you, you start be, you start getting optionality that way. And it, is Gershon still around? Like he, he's Gershon is no longer around, unfortunately. Oh. Yadu is. Uh, I think. I think he would. Did he go back to France? I, think, just, I don't remember. We had high remember. hopes for him. That was uh, there was a brief period of time where that was going to be a thing. Listen, guys. There is no young Celtics draft pick that I have not been high on in the last 30 years. Every single <laughs> one, I'm like, Joe Forte. Joe Forte is going to be the next. Oh, one. yeah. My my two biggest misfires on this one. I, the, the Celtics back in the early 2000s drafted a guy named Kedrick Brown. Oh, and, yeah. And I thought Kedrick Brown, I, I didn't know if he, he was going to be a star, but I thought he'd be a solid, like, um, you know, on the level of, uh, you know, Kyle Kuzma, you know, like that. To, and and then I think his rookie year he had one 20 and 10 game. And then for the next, I think, eight years, I said, Well, he had 20 and 10 in that one game. <laughs> and then the other guy who you guys probably remember is Marcus Banks. Yeah, oh, yeah. Marcus Banks to this day, I say, did not get a fair shot in the NBA. It doesn't matter that he like played for five different NBA teams, was given opportunity. <laughs> okay. opportunity. My favorite part of Marcus Banks' career is how 
he ended up the guy that always got traded with Sean Marion somewhere. <laughs> I don't think I remember that. I mean, yeah, he I and Sean Marion, they got traded off the top of my head. I remember they got traded to the Heat and the Raptors together. Like there may have been another <laughs> spot too, but they they both they, like they became like this weird package deal. <laughs> that was just bizarre. <laughs> It was like when Goron was like, I'm only going if you sign Zora. It's, it's, like, it's, that's it's, it. it's, it's, I believe it began when he and Marion got traded from Phoenix to Miami in the Shaq deal. Oh my gosh. Wow. You guys, you guys should have Marcus, you guys should have Marcus on the show. We should. We should. But I, I, that's, I assume he's playing abroad or something right now. I, I, I don't, I don't, I highly doubt he's, his playing career is done, but. Marcus Banks, uh, American former, ba former, uh, does say former. He's 39. He's a little, no, nope, he played for Pantheakos last year. Oh, okay. It looks like. <laughs> you didn't have to tell me that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and Marcus Banks is 39. So he's, he, it is he possible he's, he's hung it up. And he made a decent amount of money over the course of his career. You know, I mean, made $26 uh, right. million. Dollars. Right. Well, yeah. Good, good for Marcus. I'm glad, I'm glad he, uh, should have been more. That's what I say. Oh, uh, another fun fact uh, about him with the Celtics, Celtics got traded with Ricky Davis to the T-Wolves for Dwayne Jones, Michael Oluwakandi, Wally Serbiak, and a 2009 first-round pick that eventually turned into Johnny Flynn. Wow. I forgot <laughs> about that trade. And you know what's funny about this? I actually was upset about that trade because – Along with this kind of fits in with my personality. I was also a huge fan of Ricky Davis. Ricky Davis, people forget this now because Ricky Davis had that kind of rep. You know, he threw the ball on his own basket to get the triple double. And, you know, uh, but Ricky Davis was actually a very good player on that Celtics team. Okay. Fun fact you know, uh, his direct connection, Marcus Banks, to the championship of 2008 for no. the Celtics? No. He was traded by the Memphis Grizzlies with. Kendrick Perkins to the Celtics for Troy Bell and Dante Jones. Yes. Okay. I do remember this now. So wow. you're welcome. Wow. That, that is taking me back quite a ways <laughs> to the last era of Celtics championship basketball. Yeah. I, I, I love this type of totally useless crap trivia. Like this is oh, my yeah. favorite stuff in the world. Oh yeah. I, I, I love doing that too. And for the record, he was traded twice with, uh, with Sean Marion. Marcus Banks was so good for him. $26 yeah. million dollars the guy made playing pro basketball. Gonna be honest, guy, when I woke up this morning, I did not think I'd spend the day talking about Marcus Banks. Well, you're welcome. You're welcome. I should have done this live. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you're welcome to come back tonight. It's okay. <laughs> well, yeah, we'll do, we'll, we'll run it back. <laughs> God, I didn't realize you guys were going to roll out the red carpet for me. I, mean, <laughs> hey, I just thought I was going to talk a little bit of Nick's uh, and be out of here in 15 minutes. <laughs> you guys really know how to make a man feel special. <laughs> oh, man, that's funny. Um, so you wrote a great feature on Julius Randle, who's one of our favorite guys. When Julius was in L.A., uh, Andy and I planted flags on Randall Island early. Mm. Um, and... I thought we were we were rewarded by it. Uh, the guy played some pretty good basketball on some pretty crappy teams under pretty difficult circumstances. Um, goes to New Orleans. It doesn't, you know, puts up good numbers, but doesn't quite work there. Goes to the Knicks. Last year is a bit of a mess, but his he has been just destroying the league this year. 23 mm -hmm. points a game, 11 rebounds, five and a half assists. Like five and a half assists. That is a... That is an eye-popping number. He's shooting 80% from the free throw line. He's shooting 41% from three. What ha and we love this. And you know, I think actually he's still pretty popular among Lakers circles. What is what happened between age 25 year and age 26 year that we're getting this Julius Randle? Well, and 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 with there are a couple of interesting things. The first of all is last year he did not have a good year. So this comes, this comes after one of the worst years of his career. Um, for one thing, look, the Knicks roster construction is much more suited to Randall style play than it was last year, right? Last year they had eight forwards plus you guys, I think on the bench, you know, and then this year, you know, he's got, he's, you know, RJ Barrett's a much better playmaker than he was last year. You know, Mitchell Robinson's a little bit better. You know, you have, you have player, you, he has, he has players more suited to on top of that. You want to hear a crazy stat about Julius Randall, which I was just thinking about Julius Randall. 
his rookie coach was Byron Scott. Then came Luke Walton. Then came uh, Alvin Gentry. Last year, he had two coaches with uh, Fisdale and uh, Miller. And now Thibs. Julius Randle's been in the league now about six, seven years. So in seven years, seven years. Years, in, in seven years, he's had six coaches. So he hasn't really had much stability. Whatever you can say about the Knicks, this is the first year they are really um, – kind of have some stability, right? Leon Rose has installed a program. Coach Thibodeau is probably the most experienced coach that um, uh, that Julius Randle has played for. You know, so so there's, a, there's stability there. The personnel around him is there. And if there's one thing about Julius Randle, Lakers fans know this, that guy works hard at his game. Yeah. Always. Mm-hmm. He, his work ethic has always been top-notch. He's, he's kept his body in great shape. So when you have the work ethic, you know, this you can kind of you can improve your skill on that. So that's so if you so he's the kind of guy, yeah, he shoots 27% from three from one year. It's shocking to see that go to 40, but it's like, well, then again, if this guy works at it, you know, um, same thing for the passing. It's 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 unusual to see someone double their assist from year one to year two, but you know. Julius Randle really works at his game. He wasn't a bad, and he wasn't a bad passer before, and it does help. You oh, know what yeah. you're talking about. What you're talking about also is useful if you have better players around you. You get more assists because when you pass them the ball, they make a basket. When you pass Kevin Knox the ball, your chances of getting an assist are very low because he's yeah. not going to score. Right. But you know, Barrett this year, other guys like you have a better chance of actually converting on that play. And by the way, when Byron Scott coached Julius Randle. Um, like back then in that era of NBA basketball, three assists for a big man was like, oh, what a great, what a great passing big man that is. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just, it's just that was the era back then. So Julius, you're right. Julius Randle's always been a good passer. Now he's like, you know, now the way that we have positionless basketball now, like it's, 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 it's not as unusual as, as it might be, but he's still done. He really adapted his game for the modern NBA really, really well. And then the other thing is, I, I think. Coach Coach Thibs really does a good job getting Randall in spots where he can do different things. Last year, a lot of his game was like he'd get the ball in the post and he'd spin 18 times and either turn the ball over or miss like some, you know, hook shot or something. Now he's getting the ball at the free throw line. He's getting the ball at the top of the key. He's doing other things. He's getting the ball in different spots. And I think that's really helped him kind of show show what he can do on the floor. What, what were your impressions of Julius just in getting to know him for, for this profile and talking with him, talking, you know, you spoke a lot with it, with his family. I, I know from talking with him in the past, his mom has always been a big influence on him. She, you know, she was a former player herself. There's a great detail in the story about how he ended up choosing her number, which was number 30 as a kid. And she challenged him to do something with it. Otherwise, Leave no, the number you can't to me. have it, right? Like he, he always struck us as a very old soul, even when he was like twenty, and now he's like actually at a place where at twenty six he's not old, but you know you start thinking about yourself as an adult. You know what I mean? Seven years. He's been in the league seven years. So you mentioned that. So uh, you know, just I asked him that, that week. Obi Toppin and uh, Emmanuel quickly talked about Julius Randall being a veteran mentor to them, and. I found that to be so funny. And I, I mentioned this to Julius because I was like, you're 26 years old and you're being talked about by the younger guys in the locker room as like a father figure. How does that make you feel? Like they're talking about you as like, oh, he's the big brother. He's the old guy. He's telling us that you are 26 and being talked about as if you're like the Yoda. And, you know, <laughs> and, and, and he's, and he, you know, he, he took it in stride. He was very, very nice about it. And he was like, yeah, hey, listen, you know, I'm, I'm happy to pass on whatever I, I can. He's, he's very, you know, he's very, um, you know, he's very down to earth. Uh, you know, I, we sometimes, I think in the media have this expectation that basketball pl- players be something more than basketball players there's you know and yes and there are people that are like that like blake griffin's a comedian and film and tv and lebron's an activist and the, julius randall strikes me as someone who plays basketball then goes home and plays with his kid his kid yeah. his son he's a really kid. doting father very much so very much so and like you know i asked i was like so julius you know i caught up on him after practice and i said julius so what are you doing what are you doing with the rest of the day and he was like i don't know just playing with my kid 
I'm like, okay, what are you gonna do tomorrow? I don't know. Just play, you know, be with my kid, you know. And and I'm like, oh, I I relate to that because like, you know, when I get home from work, I don't want to do anything else. <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know, like I get it. Like I just want to turn on Netflix, man. Like I get. It. I don't have any. And and so that's Julius Julius Randall's life is about, from what I can tell, three things: his family, basketball, and his faith. You know, those are the three things that really kind of are his pillars. Um, and there are other players that have other other interests in life and other hobbies and and other you know they're looking they're looking at their life past their careers and you know you look at uh, you know LeBron James he has his name on dozens of film and TV projects you know same for um, you know uh, Kevin Paul. and Chris Paul right and 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 they're also you know socially active you know I don't get the sense that that is right now that is something Julius is particularly interested in. Well, it's what it's that what you're talking about there is interesting. It's just like the the not just that guys want to but they almost feel like a pressure to be a brand to be a something i yeah. wonder if that's how so many of these guys end up getting themselves into a little bit of trouble financially is just you know you you feel like well i got all this money i gotta i gotta be a, an entrepreneur i gotta be an investor i gotta be this or that or whatever as opposed to just being a really rich guy who you know instead of making 500 million dollars i made 150 and like you know that'll do um yeah. the the pressure i think sometimes comes from players to feel like they have to be more than that like especially now i think especially now there's a pressure uh to to point that but he's he doesn't i don't mean as a negative he doesn't seem to to never to fit has. that profile for what it's worth you know he's been in the league now yes yeah, i think seven years seven years he's got yeah. a lot of time left so like come 30 35 he might have other interests. Yeah. He, might, he might do want to do other things. But right now, I get the sense that he's focused on, you know. To, to on. your point, Sopan, LeBron, when he first came into the league, was not outwardly, if nothing else, interested in some of the, you know, social issues and no. activism. I mean, if anything, he was the opposite. Remember, actually, it was the opposite. Uh, you know, I remember, I think it was 2008. Was it? The Dark Four. Uh, yeah, I think it was Ira Newbel was yes. his. Uh, yes, yes, it was. Who, um, who tried to, you know, who asked him to sign that letter on China and he declined. Mm -hmm. and I think he later did under, or he later expressed regret for it. Uh, yes. You know, um, but you, you, absolutely. Um, and, and I can understand that. I can sympathize, not talking about LeBron, but but just kind of general, you know, players just want to focus on their, you know, basketball. That's their job. And all the other stuff that we talk about, um, endorsements, you know, film and TV, you know, you know, if you're, if you're Dame Lillard and you want to rap or whatever, none of that stuff happens at the level, at that peak level, unless he's good at basketball first, you know, um, at least I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't think so anyway, you know, but those, the, the doors open up, especially when you're really good at that first profession, you know? And, and so anyway, all that is to say that, you know, Julius struck me as a guy that is, is he's a very friendly guy you know, very, um, and he wanted to stay in Nick. You know, when was the last time you heard a star, you know, or a perspective, you know, maybe he makes the all-star team, you know. Um, and by the way, by the time this goes up, uh, he might have made the all-star team. So, right. Um, I believe it was Mo Taylor was the last person who, no, like, it was, well, yeah. I know he who wanted to be a Clipper, Knicks but I think he player. wanted to be a, a Nick too. Who was, the, who was the last Knicks player that was like, I want to be here long term. This is where I want to win a championship. Well, okay. They here's the thing. They all say that, you know, not when there's the a, not with the Knicks, they don't. <laughs> really? <laughs> because okay, because no, I, I've it's heard not. I've heard guys say before, like I want to be a Cav for life. Like you know, when LeBron hasn't been there, I want to be, I want to be a uh, a member of Team X for life, which usually means I want to get a long term deal. Then I'll figure out where I want to go. I just want to that's, begin that's, the foundation of a con of a contract totally with this fair. team. Yeah. I guess the question I would have with Randall is, does it seem like he means it when he says, I want to be a Nick for life? It does, but I mean, only he knows that, right? right. You, know, I, you know, me having a, you know, a conversation with him, you know, it's hard for me to gauge that. Um, but I, I will say it's different for the Knicks. You know, mm -hmm. this is a team that has won one playoff round this century, Right. Um, this is a team that hasn't made the playoffs for seven or eight years. This is a team that hasn't been able to attract free agents. In yeah. fairness, we are only a quarter or a fifth of the way through the century. 
That's true. So, I mean, you That's you true. say that like the century is basically over. <laughs> the Knicks the should be held accountable for that. They've they, got 80 years to fix that. <laughs> they love to backload. Right? I mean, <laughs> the Celtics front-loaded all their titles, and now they're yeah. kind of <laughs> easing into yeah. the next group. Right. But, like, they, you know, they still got what a bunch of those greedy bastards, Sopan. Right. Um, but for what it's worth, most players that get asked the question, do you want to stay on your team long term? In today's NBA, what they usually say is, I'm not thinking about that right now. I'm just focused on today. That's the stock answer. The stock yeah. answer okay. that you, you get is, you know, when it comes time to think about that, I will, you know, whatever. Right, I, I will, yeah. I will, uh, I will make that decision, and my our people will get back to we'll get together, blah blah blah. And, and so, the fact that you know a year and a half away from his contract being up, that he's already being like, I want to stay, yeah. you know, um, that I, I think it's telling. Now, could he be full of it, and could he be like angling for an extension or a trade or whatever? Yeah, of course. But the bigger thing here is also remember that Julius Randall may not be part of the Knicks plans going forward. That's what's fascinating. You know, and that's what makes Julius such an interesting figure here is that he's he's a he's the rare kind of franchise cornerstone that may not be a franchise cornerstone that the Knicks can view as a, a centerpiece to getting, you know, a top five, top ten guy. And and that's what puts Julius in a really kind of un unusual position. It's just I will say from the conversations that we had, a couple conversations that we had um, with him after he left LA, I, he wanted to stay here. Like, I think he's a guy who like, it, but it makes, it lines up, you know, he's very family oriented. He, you know, is home. He does, he wants to stay where he, if he, he's comfortable. He likes where he is. He wants to stay. And like, it's all things being equal. He absolutely he wanted, wanted to be in LA. Yeah. Yeah. No question. I was always surprised that LA didn't kind of, didn't really make an effort to keep Don't it. get us started. <laughs> you know, it was a little bit. We, we forget. I think we kind of forget at the time, like what it was like at the time. But LA really kind of was like of, of that whole kind of. Crew. Well, the crew, they were just. It was sort of dis. I mean, some of the guys they turned into trades and this and that, whatever. They were just sort of dismissive of Randall in ways that I, I think genuinely hurt him. You know, you want to move on from me? You don't think I'm part? of You can't sign me long term. You got. You're looking for a star. All that stuff makes sense. And these guys aren't stupid. They get it, even if they think they might be that guy. I think he felt he was genuinely the, just dismissed. The, the moment I, I, I mean, we've talked with Julius. I mean, you know, our own observations, but I think also conversations with him and being able to sort of read into things that he was saying. His last season with the Lakers, when it began with him predetermined to be coming off the bench, mm -hmm. even though he made sense, like a lot of sense, playing alongside then Brooke Lopez. And, you know, because Lopez could spate space the floor for Randall playing more inside and they could work well defensively and right. you know he came back they, to camp chiseled did yeah. all the stuff he, that they he, told him to do with his and, body and, and everything right. and he eventually ended up taking that spot um he basically outplayed Larry Nance Jr who, who was fine but you know Randall at the time was better than him mm -hmm. and that just felt like you know it just felt like a sign of what was coming for Julius which which was basically just they had already made up their mind that he was not part of the future and they were not subtle about it at all in and ways that, like Brian said, I think actually hurt him. Where you're drafted and the franchise you're drafted onto, this is a good example of how much of a difference it makes being drafted into a stable front office that knows yeah. how to develop and one that is in disarray. And when Randall was in Los Angeles and I, with all due respect to the Lakers front office, that was a front office that was in disarray. You know, they didn't have a franchise. They didn't have a stable direction. They didn't know which way they wanted to go. You had, you were on the back end of Kobe's career and, and, and still putting a lot of kind of resources into, you know, the offense and centering around Kobe Bryant and blah, blah, blah. Whereas, you know, you look at players that are drafted by Toronto or San Antonio, you know, I, you just wonder how different Julius Randle's career would have been if he got drafted somewhere else you know and 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 instead now he's had six nba coaches and, yeah, and it's funny when you when you mentioned like how it could have looked you pointed out in this piece he's yet to play for a team that finished with a winning record and, and that's and not even close to a winning record yeah he hasn't even had a team that has challenged for like 48 percent of <laughs> now some people some people would look at that as a reflection of him but that's also not fair i mean you know no, I mean, not at all, definitely not fair 
You yeah. don't say that the Celtics near you know near 500 this year is a reflection on the skill level of Jason Tatum. It's not. Um, and, you know, so fan you talk to. Don't know which fans you talk to, buddy. Right, uh, that's true. Uh, but no, uh, but fans are fans are insane, as you point yeah, out. Was it? Uh, but they are also sometimes clever. Was it you? I saw a few weeks ago who found the thing on NBA Reddit where where, where they came up with a scheme to set the steals record in a game where players could just pass the ball yeah. back and forth yeah. to each other really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> so like Boban could set the record yeah. in a single game for steals. There was another one I remember from a couple of years ago that was like, um, hey, why doesn't, why why don't the Warriors, uh, the, you know, Steph Curry takes the ball in the backcourt and why don't the other Warriors lock arms and just have <laughs> Steph walk behind them <laughs> <laughs> and just, and just, and just shoot the three as soon as they, you know, wouldn't he be open every single time? <laughs> it's like it's very oh. Sparta. It's like how they would st- how they would stage <laughs> basketball games in three hundred. Yeah, <laughs> yeah it, there, there's a lot of. I actually, I will say, I get some of my best, some of the best stories I've done for the times and the NBA has come from Reddit. Uh, <laughs> like this one, I, I did one story. Uh, Two, so I'll tell you two of them. One of them was uh, when I first got on the beat, and it just happened to be right before the playoffs started. And uh, I'm covering the finals, and the, it's the Warriors and Raptors. And um, someone on Reddit found an old column Steve Kerr wrote for Yahoo in like 2002, right after right after he um, ret- retired as a player. And he he wrote this column 18 years ago about um, what what it takes to be the perfect shooter. And he lists a bunch of like perfect shooters and some of those names. I'm not forgetting them now, but it's like, you know, it's like Peja. It's like a bunch of players, like very 2000s NBA, you know. And, you know, I so saw, you know, I talked to him about writing that column, what he remembered about it, and who the perfect shooter is today. And then the other one, which was like went pretty viral, the story, but I came across it on Reddit, was um, the, did you guys see the story about Anthony Carter? Um, Anthony Carter, yeah. former journeyman for the Miami Heat. Yeah. Uh, in the mid two thousands, he's had he has a bad year. He's been you know, but he has a player option for next year. Oh, we, that's the one where his agent screwed up, right? Yeah, you- right, right. So he he uh, has a five million dollar option that he's absolutely not going to get anywhere else. He's injured, whatever. They don't let the his agents, uh, Bill Duffy, doesn't let the team know in time that he's opting back in, making him a free agent, and so he loses out on five million. Yeah. Pounds. Uh, and so he has to settle for a vet contract. The crazy thing is they use that the Heat use that space to sign Lamar Odom, who they then trade two years later for Shaq, and then they mm-hmm. win the championship. Yeah, it was uh, one of the weirder what ifs in the NBA history. But anyway, so I'm on Reddit maybe four four months ago, and and uh, I see a post that's like, "Congratulations, Anthony Carter," because it turns out Anthony Carter years ago told a reporter that Bill Duffy told Anthony Carter that he would repay him mm-hmm. for the money he lost out of his own pocket. And they did it in installments. And in like 2000, I don't remember when the interview, probably 2012. Yeah, yeah, the payment should be up in 2020. I was like, oh shit, it's, it's 2020 right now. <laughs> so I reached out to Anthony Carter. I was like, have you been paid off? And he's like, yeah. And then, you know, we, we talked about it and it was a great story. And Reddit is. I remember, I really, holy, I remember that story. Holy, holy, holy responsible for. And I remember the best part about the story is that I, when I reached out to Bill Duffy's office to talk about it, just the bafflement in their voice of like, you're calling about what? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, what story are you doing? <laughs> It was just what I, I man, I wish I could replay that. It's the thing I found on Reddit. Yeah, I don't yeah, want to. Wait, wait, what is Reddit? What? Yeah. Oh, by the way, I, I pulled up that column, the uh, the perfect shooter column from Dece- of December tenth, two thousand three. Here oh, are yeah. the names. Here are the names that he would put in to what Steve Kerr calls Robo Shooter. Steve Nash makes sense. Ray Allen, Reggie Miller, Peja, Sam Cassell. Oh. Eric Pyatkowski. Oh That's yeah, insane. that is the name. I was thinking, yeah. Eric, the thing about Eric Pyatkowski is, for a long time, he was the greatest Clipper of all time. <laughs> <laughs> he really was. He was so the longest tenure. Blake Griffin He's, was. Yes. He, was he a top three behind Cassell and Brand? Probably. Right. Um, yeah. Like, it depends wow. what you think of. Like, do you give him credit for longevity over Danny Manning? 
Um, probably. Yeah. Uh, but well. Pike, Pike was the longest tenured uh, uh, Clipper until DeAndre. DeAndre Jordan is the only person to play for that team for a decade, which is a staggering statistic to me. Um, anyway, you- Glenn Rice, yeah. Michael Red, Alan oh, Houston, man. and the last name, Pat Garrity. Oh, yeah. wow. Pat gets on yeah. Yeah. Oh, man, Pat Garrity. I think he was on one of those T-Mac teams where he averaged 35 a game for the year. I think he was on the, with like Daryl Armstrong. I think yes. anyway. Yes. I, I think that was the Pat. That's the Pat Garrity I remember. Um, but yeah, I talked to Steve about that piece. So he gave me a new list of names, and I think they were all Warriors. <laughs> As he said, uh, by the way, Robo Shooter can't play any defense. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He did right there. in the column. Yeah, so that. that's right. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I, um, I was gonna say you, you mentioned uh, Pat Garrity. Um, let me find him really quickly. I want to talk about a guy that would be just cast as the role of your shooter for folks that don't remember. Uh, Mr. Are you Garrity? trying to really find it? While you find a picture of Pat Garrity, I'm just going to put up the gif of uh, <laughs> of uh, pelvic thrusting John Travolta just to pass the time. Yeah, here we go. Okay, Mr. I'll, Mr. Take, Garrity, I'll Mr. take Garrity is joining us. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> my God, you want to talk about somebody who looks like he is in the league purely to shoot and then stay out of the way? This guy right here. Now, this is this, I believe, is Steve Blake's father or what? <laughs> <laughs> hey, now. <laughs> but yeah. I hey, mean, what if you get excited by shooters? <laughs> Oh, love that. Um, before we let you go, because we know you got to run here, uh, we do want to give you time to uh, point out a great personal triumph. Oh, um, yes. Yes. For people who don't know, you are uh, arguably the greatest Dave Matthews fan uh, in the world, and he has been named the uh, greatest of all time adult alternative artist. That, yes. sir, makes you sound cool. Yeah, I... I... Uh, I feel like I have been named best contemporary adult adult artist of uh, in, by Billboard. How 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 many times did you vote? Like this feels like when when all this stuff about the the stolen election of 2020. Um, this feels like one where there may actually have been election fraud, and it was all done by you. Well, I can't I can't confirm or deny those accusations, other than to say there may be a lot of opans that have, <laughs> <laughs> that put in vote. Uh, I can't say that I'm those people. Go I'm Pan saying, Seb. I, I'm just saying I agree with their stances on that. Live, live look at uh, Opan's reaction to seeing <laughs> yeah. the news. I remember uh, I took my fiance, now fiance, then girlfriend, the last Dave Matthews show I, we went to, I think it was probably 2018. And just, I remember, yeah, I don't know if you guys have ever seen Dave, but, um, you know, I they, have uh, in college. Like, yeah. like yeah. anybody who went to college between 1994 and 1998, I did see Dave Matthews live. The, the encore comes, and my fiance is giving me that look like, it's time to go. <laughs> 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 and so uh, anyway, she was like, you know, the opening notes, the two-step hit, and Wesley, you know, my fiance is like, all right, we've been okay. doing this long enough. Okay. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> All right. I've tolerated this yeah. for quite long enough. Thank you. They, they've got a weird thing with me, Dave. And, and full disclosure, I'm not a fan at all. <laughs> but they've got this weird thing where I feel all of their songs to me feel like they, they have an accordion in them. And maybe they do actually have an accordion in them. And I just am not aware of it. <laughs> but they all. Played. They've had a. They, uh, it's sax, violin. Well, no longer violin. They fired the violin player. Yeah, he uh, knows what he did. <laughs> sax, sax, keyboard, trumpet. Or the maybe it's yeah. maybe all of those together to me and like sort that's, of the, the rhythms sax, that they use. Sax, keyboard, trumpet. Add them all together. It's a. It's a <laughs> I, I don't know what it is. Like it, it. Like they. They feel to me like the closest thing to Weird Al Yankovic. Like just in the use of accordion in pop music. But uh, <laughs> I gotta say, I've heard a lot of Dave Matthews like kind of slander over the years. I've never heard closest to reminding me of Weird Al in my life. That's a, that's a 
big first for me. Like I've never heard that in my life. How much of your life do you spend defending your standing for, for Dave Matthews? You know, it used to be a lot more and then other people got exhausted by trying to move. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> they just got tired of it. Yeah, like, I think when critics come at you, they have in their head like this assumption that like they can move you. Mm -hmm. Even, you know, and then after a while, people I think people just kind of realize, like, oh no, this guy's this guy's a dedicated to the cause. There's no moving, <laughs> there's no he, he can't be stopped, you know. And so a lot less than I a lot less than I used to. And the other thing I've done is like I feel like I see this on Twitter is like people are more comfortable talking about how much they actually like Dave Matthews because they see how shamelessly I pander to you know Dave Matthews fan. But like what about people like getting used to like, no, I, I hate to say this, but I just wanna I've seen Dave Matthews man ten are times. You, are you like a human DMB safe space? And and yeah, and the weird thing is like Dave Matthews has no idea who I am, has mm -hmm. never heard of me. Not yet. Has, <laughs> yeah, I've never, uh, you know, we met once. I was 18 years old, and I and I waited outside. Uh, um, I waited outside. Uh, you know, in December in Boston, I waited outside a, a acoustic show he was playing to um, get an autograph. You know, um, and and so you know he has no idea who I am, but like, you know, but it's like you know, have there are a lot of like you know LeBron James fans who are out there, and like LeBron has no idea who they are. You yeah. know. Well, so Pan, you mentioned that uh, Dave Matthews doesn't know who you are, and that you know you obviously are a big fan. And we we did want to save this until the end, um, a chance to meet you, you know, get you guys together. Um, oh, wow. and, and, and 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 do. I'm just kidding. I just wanted to play this. Again. Ah! <laughs> that's that's not a dance, a dance. Show. What would, what would you have done if we had actually produced Dave Matthews for you live on the last five minutes of the show? Uh, I would come back for the live taping of this. <laughs> we, we we did though notice. I, I mean, wait, yes, to live. <laughs> part of what jumped out at us beyond just knowing how much you love Dave Matthews is going through your timeline of late. There's a lot of uh, AOR happening right now. <laughs> this tweet. I don't want to ruin anyone's day, but I I really once again cannot stop listening to Fields of Gold by Sting or covers of Fields of Gold by Sting. Um, you also had a great joke about the uh, podcast that just came out with. Uh, President Obama and Bruce Springsteen, where you said, I haven't clicked the link yet. <laughs> Please let it be called the middle. Yeah. <laughs> it's quite a time for AOR. Yeah. Well, the middle is you know, Springsteen's Super Bowl commercial. And I just thought that was a very funny commercial. Like you, you spent your whole life speaking out on behalf of liberal causes and not doing commercials in part because you don't want to be seen as a sellout or whatever. And then it's 2021. Oh my God. And this is the first thing you choose to like. Why is he wearing a cowboy hat? In the, in the, <laughs> I, I saw I the same thing. You're from Jersey. <laughs> yeah, but but he's been doing this though for like the last 25 years. Like Springsteen has been, and, and I want to preface this by saying I don't find this overtly performative because I, I think Springsteen is a generally pretty sincere guy, but he's transformed himself like into the Marlboro man, <laughs> you know, like there, there was this, you know, he's always had this like Tom Joad thing going, including the album he had that was called the ghost of Tom Joad. But like, you're watching him in this thing. He's got, like you said, that cowboy hat and like the jean jacket with the fuzzy collar driving that open Jeep through some small town. I'm like, dude, what, what is this? Like, I don't even get this. Right. What is it? About, like the, the middle and like, blah, blah, blah. And like, Bruce, we've heard your political like stances over the last. You don't even believe in the middle. That's what you believe in. What are you talking about? Well, that's what's so funny though is like the idea of Springsteen putting out this dad energy now, like trying to be the adult in the room for America, just like you know making sure that all the kids get along. I'm like, you're a rock star. Like rock stars are supposed to piss people off. Like right. that's the point. Right, right. And this is like the people that like. A play born in the USA without realizing what the message right. is. Right. Republican campaign. Like, really, yeah. really not the, it is not the song that you should be playing I, at I a Republican say, campaign rally. Take it, you know, from, from, you know, I used to cover, you know, I covered the 16 campaign before I, you know, came to the Times. And I find it very funny. That there's like this rule that, like, anytime there's like any sort of Democratic event anywhere in the world, 
like the rising has to play somewhere <laughs> within two hours of that event somewhere there needs to be a reference to like land of hopes and dreams or the rising or city of ruins one of those songs has to play at any democratic event going back you know to even before those songs were written you know like like it, it is very funny to me how much like at the dnc every commercial break they're yeah. playing one of those songs the, the need for both political parties to co-op springsteen onto their side and sports is, reporters, and and middle-aged sports yeah reporters. It, well <laughs> that makes but middle-aged sports reporters make sense to me and uh, but the, like you could write a book about how just you know how how both sides tussle over the ability to play springsteen at their campaign rallies maybe that is the middle <laughs> yeah that's right um, <laughs> that's the middle sports, sports writers <laughs> well uh, congratulations on the uh on the book uh you know that, that is written it is sold um and you did that without signing a 120 million dollar contract like gordon hayward he could do it like gordon hayward can sit down and write trying. a novel without yeah trying not for lack of trying yeah but um you know he could he has the the the, the petty cash to be able to do it yeah. um and so uh but you can Gordon Hayward becoming a novelist is a plot twist i did not see coming <laughs> <laughs> but it's coming might as well yeah he's got a long life to live which oh wait before um, you get into and the, uh, uh can i can i can we do a quick oh, sure story? which nba wait, player we can do whatever you want like we're we're, yeah, we're yeah. trying to keep to your schedule <laughs> no. which nba player do you guys think is the most likely to have a novel like stashed away somewhere i assume jj reddick already has three <laughs> yeah that's a good one um i could see lebron like potentially like delving into well, autobiography or novel novel, or novel. Oh, i'm not talking about memoirs because right andre Godala just uh, did a memoir that came out last year and it was a bestseller hmm. i think reddick that's strikes me reddick strikes me as somebody who would write a novel yeah. Like, yeah, he actually really does. He's got um, big novel energy on that podcast. Oh, and also, too, I mean, you know, his, his podcast is, you know, The Old Man and the Three has got that literary reference. Like, I, I'm I'm going Reddick. Oh, that's, that's pretty my good. Answer. I would have said Pow, but now he's in Barcelona. Mm, yeah. I, for some reason, I have no idea why. I seem to think, I, I you know, Kyle Lowry, I seem to I, I identify with the novel writing only because, like, I think because I, I identify as embellishments as a defender. <laughs> so I can create good fiction. <laughs> you know, like it's all the great up. it's all the great floppers in the league yeah. who put out the best novels. It's Lowry and Marcus Smart on Zooms on their Zoom writing workshops. Yeah. Every week. It's, it's about a protagonist who always falls down. Yeah. <laughs> Roy Hibbert. Well, thank you guys so much for having me on as always. I'm looking forward this, to this. Again. This was great, man. We'll do it thank again you uh, when you when you can. All right, guys. Take care. All right, and everybody, I think you can hear us and see us again. Um, that was fun. I enjoyed yeah. that. Go fans, great. Um, so before we go, the, the you know the, the the big news of the day around the NBA was uh, All Star stuff. You know the the reserves were named. Um, I guess these teams are so small at this point. Like it's it's really hard to find guys who like you look at it and you say flat don't deserve to be on it so i ask you this question no jamal mclore this season correct um no offense, I, but so i say this um with fully with the the awareness of i don't know who i would take off the team i'm really sad mike conley didn't make it yeah like, it, it felt like mike conley really thought this was gonna finally be the year he had yep. that great quote about getting to the front of the line at the dmv and he's got both forms of id ready and all that like this is the year he didn't get in you know what it's like several years ago uh that year that lamar odom thought he was gonna make it and there was there was kind of a groundswell of support and i think it was the year that he won six man of the year he mm -hmm. he really wanted to get that one time like it mattered to him like you know he Took it well, and you know that that was fine. But he right. he really did want that, and someone like Mike Conley, like you know the idea. Like, of, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. I was gonna say the idea of being you know being thought of as the the best player who never made an All Star team. On one hand, it's an acknowledgement that your career was better than a lot of people may give it credit for. On the other hand, it's a reminder you never made an All Star team. Yeah, and it's just like he's such a good dude, and he's he's a really he good player, great guy. And he's, he's just a, a nice he's guy. great player, 
And but I don't know who you take off. I mean, it, here's the thing, and like, and I this is where in the West. And well, AD is not going to play, and like Conley is not one of these dudes who's going to be like, you know, I, I, that won't count for me unless I'm named. The, if he's the injury replacement for Anthony Davis, Mike Conley was. I am on an All Star team, and I, you know, I made an All Star team. But Devin Booker is sitting there too. Like, hey guys, um, I would put Conley on first, but I don't know. I mean, both of those guys. How do you? You choose. I mean, I don't. And I don't know who I'd take off. I mean, Paul George is an All Star. He's played very well this year. You know, Gobert in the West. I probably it, in the if you actually care about this stuff, because uh, as I, I, I am, and I don't. Well, but I was going to say. I mean, outside of the guys that their merit is just so rock solid, you can't have one of these things. You know, this iron so ironclad, you can't have one of these things without just having them there. Otherwise, it's a joke. When you start getting to the the guys under them who are all basically the same and you're you're pretty much just splitting hairs, I always lean towards who's most entertaining because mm-hmm. this thing is just a glorified exhibition. So give me, you know, the most just well, that's gonna put Booker on over Conley, though. Sure. I mean, it, fine. Yeah. But I mean, like that I was gonna say, like but but the the, the point I was gonna get at though, it, you could put uh, Booker over Conley for that. I was going to say, if you're looking to take somebody off, outside of just the pure entertainment value, you take Zion off. He didn't play enough games. Yeah, I could see that. I mean, how I mean, many do you play? Um, how, many, how many has he missed? I will take a look. Versus how many has New Orleans played? Because I get really confused based on, you know, the the the, the weirdness of this year's schedule. Um Oh, you know what? my my. I mistake. think Zion's played. He's played more. He's. I thought he missed a few more than he had. My mistake. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't think he had, but I, I you know, like ben, I said, I lose track. Um, I don't know. I mean, who you take? And off? he's also shooting like seventy percent. Okay, here's who you take off. Go through the list. Who is the most boring player in the All Star on the West? Sub um, him out. Put in Mike Conley for him because if you're going to be boring, at least give it's Mike not Conley Zion. It ain't sure as hell no, it's Zion. Well, it's not Donovan Mitchell. It's not Damian uh, Lillard, who you can't take off even if you wanted to. Uh, it's not Gobert. Well, maybe it's Gobert. Yeah, it's Gobert. Gobert. so take, take off Gobert. Gobert. Yeah, it's who an fucking game. cares about defense? Yeah, what's All-Star he going to do in a def- It's like you know, let's go small. Right. Exactly. So. <laughs> you, you know what? You you put Booker in for AD. You put Conley in for Gobert. And you go small. You play Zion at the five, and you go. Sure, yeah, I'm in so, for that. Uh, yeah, I, I, I would. I also, I would have had Trey Young in there just because a he's exciting, entertainment factor. B the damn thing is in Atlanta, and it's hard enough to get Hawks fans into the you know into the NBA. Period. How do you not have Trey Young here? Like take Vucevic off. He's he's not exciting to watch play. Yeah, I, I have to say that this is you know we'll, we'll we'll leave here after this. But like the it's all star rosters are really. St- stupidly small yeah in my opinion i think these are there we add two spots i mean every once in a while you're gonna it doesn't end snubs and it doesn't and there's always gonna be someone and every once in a while you'll end up with jamal mcglore as you this is i mean it's an exhibition add two more guys come on why not um do it um anyway so uh tomorrow we will welcome we've got some great guests lined up for the rest of the week we got uh sabrina merchant's gonna come on tomorrow after the well, it's still a big game between the Lakers and the Jazz tomorrow. Lakers trying to shake their losing streak and start looking better uh, without Schroeder and AD in the lineup. Uh, Thursday, we'll turn to baseball. Jorge Castillo is going to join us. The spring training has started, um, and so we need to catch up on that. Um, Friday, Dave Schilling, who is incredibly funny yes. uh, and super entertaining, a good friend of the show. We've had him on a couple times. He'll join us. And then Monday, uh, Ali Khan who uh, many people yeah. know from the Food Network, uh, a good friend of ours. He's going to come on to talk food and television and food television. Um, so that's what we're doing. Yeah, should be a lot of fun. We will see everybody tomorrow after Lakers Jazz. Donk, you need a line.